Now, the latest ITV News in London with Lucrezia Mellarini. Tonight, BMX bumper special. Londoners win gold and silver at the Olympics. And Pia Spanabegum is found not guilty of housing fraud and... <laughs> Tower Hamlets launches a vaccine festival offering free food if you get the jab. Good evening. It's been another eventful day at the Olympics, in particular for two young BMX racers from London. Prince of Peckham, Kai White, made history, becoming the first Brit to win a medal in the sport at the Olympics with his silver, before cheering from the sidelines as his teammate Beth Shriver from Leytonstone crossed the line to win gold in the women's race. But getting to the Games hasn't been the easiest of rides for either of them. In a moment, we'll hear from Chloe Keady, who spent the day in Peckham, celebrating Kai's win. But first, Antoine Allen on our Olympic champion, Beth Shriver. A race against the odds. It's a good start, Bethany Shriver. There you go. Bethany Shriver has had to overcome more than just the humps of BMX racing to bring home a gold at her first Olympics. The 22-year-old golden performance would not have been possible without the support and funding from her parents. Watching from their home in Essex, her family cheered her across the line. It's been very up and down. I've had to rely mostly on my mum and dad throughout my uh, career in BMX, but to now be fully funded by British Cycling and UK Sport, um, it's, it's amazing. I'm so grateful. When Bethany first started racing, her bike was secondhand. In 2019, she was treated as a second-class athlete. Women's BMX Racing lost their UK Sport funding, resulting in Bethany having to work in a school alongside her mother, whilst crowdfunding for her Olympic dream. Bethany worked as a teaching assistant. She's now an Olympic gold medalist. Just how big of a role model is she? Well, I mean, even before she became an Olympic medalist, um, she was a role model to many girls at the BMX track around the UK. She always races national. She's always got time. Even in Europe, she's got time for young girls. But I think this now has literally opened it up and uh, there's going to be a lot more girls, hopefully, wanting to join the sport, which is really one of the main goals for Beth. The highs of BMX racing do not come without the lows of potential injury. In March, Bethany trained whilst recovering from a dislocated shoulder. The Essex woman is used to overcoming setbacks. During the lockdown, she trained in her dad's shed. Paul, so this is where Olympic dreams were made. Just how hard has Bethany's journey been? It's been it's been tough. It's been there's been a, a bit of a roller coaster. Beth has had a number of injuries and actually she's been out of action for months at a time. Um, and she's come back and, and been driven and, and focused. When your daughter first got onto one of these BMXs, did you think she'd go all the way to become a gold medalist? That's a good, that's a good question. I, I suppose I dreamed of it. Um, whether or not she would actually get there is, is another question. How does it feel now that dreams come true? Um, amazing. BMX riding runs in Bethany's family. Both of her brothers have been international BMXs. Her younger brother is a former world champion. So this is a house of BMXs, essentially. So now you've got an Olympic champion. If you all go to the track, who's going to win? Hey, um, so much for Team GB and athletes to celebrate, isn't there? Yeah, I was going to say, what's been happening on the BMX track is far from the whole story, mm. of course. So in rowing, the men's eight team won a bronze medal. But actually, it hasn't been a great year for rowing. Uh, Mohamed Spihi from Kingston and also Great Britain's flag bearer said oh, they were actually they disappointed with the result and they had hoped for more. Clearly, like, there's an element of disappointment and frustration. Um, we're one of the biggest funded teams um, from the National Lottery. We haven't got the return. We feel that frustration as much as everybody else, and we have to own that frustration and own our own results. 
Well, our team in Tokyo also managed to catch up with Mallory Franklin, uh, our silver medalist from yesterday's canoe slalom. And she said that although she hadn't been able to celebrate quite how she might have chosen to without her family and friends out there in Japan, she'd still managed to enjoy her win all the same. I've spoken to Kira and my fiancé a teeny bit. Um, he's doing a lot of celebrating for me back home. So um, they haven't had a huge amount of chance, but yeah, everyone's just been amazing. Like so much support from all of like my Instagram just going crazy with message requests and like, yeah, it's just been amazing, all of it. So yeah, an incredible first week. So much to celebrate, particularly for London uh, athletes yeah. and no doubt plenty more excitement to come. Yes, I'm sure there will be, Chloe, thank you. Oh, talking of which, this weekend there is plenty more to look forward to from our London athletes in Tokyo. Joining me now to talk about a couple of the potential highlights are Montel Douglas, the former British record holder for the 100 metres, and Cara Mulrini, the head of South Essex Gymnastics Club, where Max Whitlock trains. Um, thank you both for joining me this evening. Uh, Montel, let's start with you. Uh, track and field got underway today. Lots of excitement about that. Um, Dean Asher-Smith, Asher Phillip and Dal Nita in the heats, the 100 metre heats this morning. They've all gone through to the final, which happens over the weekend. But so many eyes will be on Dina Asher-Smith, won't they? Because she's the fastest British woman in history. She's got a good chance, hasn't she? Yeah, of course. We were all waking up to amazing results today. And it gives huge opportunity for people to compete. And I think that it's going to be something, something different for us to look forward to. Yeah, more and more to look forward to. Montel, thank you so much for talking to us. We're going to talk to Cara now. Hi, Cara. Listen, let's talk about Max Whitlock. He goes into the final of the Pommel Horse tomorrow and he's defending, of course, his Olympic title. He must be feeling confident, though. Uh, I mean, we'd like to hope so. Obviously, mm. our confidence is in Max. Um, his grind is, is amazing in the gym. You know, he's put in so much hard work and effort. Um, you know, we'd like to hope that he brings home the gold, obviously, yeah. but we'll be proud of him, whatever happens. Uh, like I said, he, he, he trains so hard and he has worked so hard for this Olympics. Obviously, like we said, it's a year late this year. Um, so we just like to wish him the best of luck here. Everyone's <laughs> rooting for him and, and whatever the outcome, you know, we, we know he's tried his best. <laughs> um, and Kari, like you said, you're the head of the gym in Essex where Max trains and he has had an interesting way of trying to recreate the atmosphere in Tokyo, hasn't he, apparently? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, going through, through the lockdown, he, he took his pommel horse home with him. Uh, he was training a lot at home. Um, and then when the, when the elite athletes were allowed to come back into the gym, he was training on his own. Um, so, you, you, you know, it's a very, very different atmosphere this, this time round. Um, you know, we just hope that he does the, the best that he can. Um, like I said, he, he trains really hard, he works really hard, and he's got the support out there of his coach, Scott Han, um, who's going to be great for him in, in that atmosphere. So. We just saw some very cute pictures. It looks like the entire family was helping him train out then. And final question to you, Cara. We talked to Montel about we saw the first um, mixed uh, races on the track, didn't we? We see mixed teams um, in, in gymnastics as well in the future. That could be a good thing, couldn't it? Uh, it's definitely something that, 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 that we'd, we would love to see. You know, the, the boys and the girls are getting working a lot closer together now. Um, it, it's always been a very divided sport, but we like to hope that the, that the girls and the boys are working a lot closer alongside each other. Uh, that, you know, this, this Olympics, they've been really, really supportive of each other. And, yeah, it'd be great to see a bit of a difference, a bit of something different in the competition. Well, listen, it's going to be exciting to watch it all play out over the weekend. Uh, Cara Mulrini and Montel Douglas, thank you both for joining me this evening. Thank you. And, of course, there will be plenty more coverage of Team GB's fantastic Friday success on the ITV News at 6.30, as well as the rest of the day's stories. Well, next tonight, Poplar and Limehouse MP Espana Begum wept in court today after she was cleared of housing fraud. The Labour politician was on trial for three counts of dishonesty in relation to a council housing application. Our senior correspondent, Ronke Phillips, is here. So, Ronke, what can you tell us? Well, this prosecution was brought by Tower Hamlets Council and they'd claimed that a spanner Begum had withheld information about her circumstances to move up the social housing register. It was claimed Miss Begum had deliberately lied about living in overcrowded and overcrowded three-bedroom property in Poplar with five members of her family saying she didn't have her own room. 
Well, the prosecution said the property actually had four bedrooms and that the number of people living there was incorrect because her father had died and her aunt had moved out. So Espana Begum maintained the entire time that she'd never had her own bedroom while living there and she blamed who she called her controlling husband for who she said controlled her finances and she said she was shocked to discover that her name was on the paperwork. The jury believed her. They said she was telling the truth. They returned three counts of not guilty to fraud. And as you said, she wept when those verdicts were returned and read this statement outside court. This case has been driven by malicious intent and has caused me great distress and damage to my reputation. As a survivor of domestic abuse facing these vexatious charges, the last 18 months of false allegations and accusations, online sexist, racist and Islamophobic abuse and threats to my safety have been exceedingly difficult. Now, I should say that Miss Begum's husband, who's called Essam Haq, denies all the allegations that were made in the trial against him, and he says he has never behaved inappropriately towards his wife. Um, the MP for Poplar and Limehouse, uh, meanwhile, says that she's taking time out to consult and consider. All right, Ronke, okay, thank you. Some other news now. The 30-year-old man has died after being stabbed in Greenwich. The man was found injured on Welland Street early this morning before being taken to hospital where he died. Another man in his 20s was found nearby with stab injuries. He's been arrested on suspicion of murder. A 24-year-old man has admitted assaulting England's chief medical officer, Professor Chris Whitty, in St James's Park in June. Lewis Hughes pleaded guilty to assault by beating. One second man, Jonathan Chu, pleaded not guilty to the same charge. And reality TV star Stephen Bear has appeared in court to deny sharing sexual images. The 31-year-old from Loughton is accused of secretly recording himself with a woman and posting the footage online. He pleaded not guilty this morning at Chelmsford Crown Court and will now stand trial in February. London's Violence Reduction Unit was set up in 2018. It's aimed to work with communities and provide opportunities for young people to reach their potential. Today, it announced funding specifically for youth workers in the capital, whose work is vital but has been severely underfunded, as Rhea Chatterjee reports. This is youth work. It's in the tiny details and the understanding that not sometimes need unpicking, even for children as young as eight. Why do you like coming to the immediate theatre group? Because uh, it helps me with my emotions. It's so sad. Uh, they help me understand if they're sad by the look on their face. And if they're, like, really angry, it helps me because if they're angry, I can help them cool off and stuff like that. Because we always have to make sure that we get their opinion so we can voice that out. Kiana was once supported by youth workers, so she's giving back. And she welcomes the new funding from the city's violence reduction unit. £1.1 million will give up to 200 youth workers training in mentoring, safeguarding and mental health support. Young people often feel neglected. They feel like they're not heard, that they're targeted and when they walk around the communities, they're very self-aware and conscious about where they're going because they don't feel as if they can walk freely. They're not able to travel without being paranoid. So we try to make sure that they're able to empower themselves and find ways that they feel more confident wherever they are. This is my best friend, take picture. Huge cuts to youth services over a long period of time. 1.1 million won't really touch the surface, will it? We can't um, undo the, the decade of austerity, but what we can do is what we've okay, heard from the practitioners then. Yeah, that won't be the only this uh, is to make sure that we used to us by that. are able to provide the training and support they need to go on to provide that key relationship with young people. Today's play is sci-fi, but it's often reality they explore themes such as racism and stop and search. Today, MPs criticised the police for doing too little 
to stamp out racial injustice in their ranks since the McPherson report 22 years ago, which found the Met Police institutionally racist following the murder of Stephen Lawrence. So one of the things you're calling for is a new post, uh, a race inequality commissioner. Why should people have faith that that would work? To chase progress and to make sure that it actually happens in practice, in order to be able to monitor progress, in order to be able to hold police forces to account, in order to be able to challenge the Home Office. While politicians push for change on a national scale, Kiana is doing exactly the same on a local level. Some of the funding will provide food for these children. Ria Chatterjee, ITV News. Now, there haven't been many festivals happening this year, but there was one in Tower Hamlets today. The council there have launched four days of music, food and events to encourage the younger population to come and get vaccinated. The East London Borough has the lowest uptake of the jab in the entire country. Well, Sam Holder went to see if this vaccine festival is making a difference. Live music, free food and a vaccine. The plan by Tower Hamlets, a vaccine festival. The outcome, not quite Glastonbury, but this was only the first morning of a four-day fest. And in the area with the worst take-up in the country, they need to try something different. I, I have a feeling that a lot of people who come here this weekend will be coming because the vaccinations have come, has come to them. People have busy lives, people can be quite socially isolated. If you get an appointment on the internet and you have to travel six miles to get your jab, then for some people that's just going to be too much hassle. Just 39% of people in the borough have been double jabbed. Tower Hamlets has a particularly young population. The average age here is just 31. But even so, take up rates of the first vaccine, which have been available to over 18s for more than a month, is way below the national average. The aim here is to reach young people they normally wouldn't. And though hardly anyone seemed to be enjoying the vibes, a steady stream were getting jabbed. Almost everyone a walk-in. Benham had been reluctant to get his before today. I keep calling a friend of mine. I asked them, they said it's good you to do the vaccine and you save your life and the other people as well. And then you just happened to see this yeah. happening today? Yeah. It's so exciting. <laughs> you could have got it before this yes. point. What was, what was stopping you? Nothing was stopping me. I just didn't have the time. I was, I was really busy and my, um, the, um, my place, my GP, is registered at my university. So I would have travelled all the way to university, which I didn't want to do. So I was trying to find places where you just walk in and get your job done. Do events like this have an impact? Definitely. We personally have seen the uptake especially around age, around BME. The hope for this weekend is modest, just a 1,000 vaccinations. But if they can reach those they haven't before, then whatever the turnout in front of the stage, it will have been worthwhile. Sam Holder, ITV News. Time for the weather now, and it doesn't quite feel like summer anymore, does it? So how is the weekend looking? Here's Ashlyn with the forecast. Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV London Weekend Weather. Hello there and a very good evening to everybody at home. Well, we've got Storm Averts moving through over the next few hours. Some strong winds out there at the moment and scattered showers as well. But those winds will ease through tonight. The showers will ease off as well. But through the day on Saturday and on Sunday, there will be a scattering of showers around, perhaps less so though on Sunday. So over the next few hours, the centre of that low pressure system pulls away. So for a time, it is actually dry and then overnight, temperatures holding up. So actually it's quite mild tonight. We start off tomorrow morning around 14 degrees Celsius. But once that sunshine comes up first thing tomorrow it's going to help to generate some showers. So almost anywhere likely to catch a shower through the day but certainly plenty of sunshine in between the showers but perhaps the showers becoming a little bit more frequent during the afternoon and a warmer day as well. Less windy temperatures around 23 degrees Celsius. Now from Saturday into Sunday those showers are going to slowly but surely start to ease off and then as we head through the early hours of Sunday morning the isobar is opening out which means it's going to be less windy still though the risk of one or two showers pushing in from the northwest as we head through Sunday morning.
Great Western Railway sponsors the ITV London Weekend Weather. Hello, Summer. Piri sponsors ITV Pollen Count. Well, we have come to the end of grass pollen season, but there's still weed pollen around at the moment, fungal spores as well. But the pollen count is forecast to be low through the weekend and low all the way through to Monday. Bye-bye. And finally tonight, we are marking South Asian Heritage Month by looking at a football club which is based in Kent, but whose heart is in India. Punjab United says it's open to everyone, regardless of age, race, religion, sexual orientation or ability. Andrew Pate has been to Gravesend to find out more. Created by two brothers and their friends, Punjab United originally only had Asian players, but now it's a multicultural club and a hub for people of all ages across Gravesend. Part of our Sikh culture, we have to give back. You know, we do seva, which is what, exactly what I'm doing really here, what our committee is doing. We're giving up our time. We come here, we work. We've got kids now, got 250 kids training during the week. You know, got the kids teams here, which are all mixed. You know, and if you come here and you see what we've done, you know, you build it and you see like a family atmosphere, exactly what we are, exactly what we're doing here. You know, this is why people want to come and play for us. Doesn't matter what colour you are, who you are, they come to Punjab, they feel like a family. Punjab United has teams from the under eights right up to the semi professional side playing at the moment. And it brings together players and supporters from across Kent, no matter what their gender or heritage. Back-to-back -back promotions mean the team's now playing at its highest ever level, the Southern Counties East Premier Division. And over the last six years, the Steve Cook Stadium has been transformed. Here, hosting the first ever non-league diversity football festival. I mean, it's good for obviously all the, the local primary schools and secondary schools, you know what I mean, to, um, to obviously know Punjab is here. And if anyone wants to come and play football, then they're down and welcome to come and play. It doesn't matter whether, what sort of background you're from, doesn't matter male, female, doesn't matter at all. Come down and play, everyone's welcome. We've got a clubhouse, clubhouse. We've got, yeah, we've got a clubhouse, we've got changing rooms and it's really helpful. Like, it's like somewhere that's semi, one, of, one of the good semi-pros teams in Gravesend. It's nice to see your team developing, yeah. Sporting Cows are lifted this inaugural trophy, beating Punjab United, as well as Leicester Nirvana and Sporting Bengal. But this is one football club where sometimes it really is the taking part that matters. We look at the Steve Cook Stadium here today, they have transformed the local area and they've also provided a platform to so many young people so that they can not just keep on the straight and narrow, but they can channel their energies into a positive sense. They say their rise through the divisions has even surprised them. But for the South Asian friends who formed the club, Punjab United joyfully continues to grow. Andrew Pate, ITV News, Gravesend. Brilliant. That is it for now. We are back with the late news at 10.50.